This lecture is going to continue our investigation of avian anatomy and physiology and we're going to first look at the uh, metabolism in birds and the really high metabolism that they have and the associated anatomy and physiology that is required to maintain that high metabolism and starting with the digestive system. So as I mentioned, birds have really high metabolism. They are endothermic, so they have the ability to physiologically generate high body heat. And they use that uh, and other mechanisms to maintain homeothermy. So in most cases, birds are able to maintain a relatively stable body temperature. And uh, that's, there's some certain benefits associated with that, but there are also some costs associated with it. So in general, the body temperature of birds is really high compared to mammals. So 39 to 40 degrees Celsius or in Fahrenheit, that's 102 to 111. So what is normal for a bird would be a dangerous fever for us. And birds need twice the energy of similar sized mammals to maintain that high metabolic rate. So here's a demonstration of that. If you look at body mass, and how it relates to field metabolic rate as measured in the field. You see that there is a positive relationship for both mammals and birds, but notice that the, the slope is the same, but the line is above that of the mammals when you look at birds. And again, this is on a log scale, so just a little bit of difference is, is quite a bit of difference as far as the metabolic rate for any given size compared to a mammal. So metabolic rate does vary with size. And so here is a figure from your book that I wanted to go through. Um, so if you uh, look at the top and the bottom, they're the same. They're measuring the same variables, but the only difference is the top one uh, is a linear uh, measurement and the, uh, the bottom one is looking at it from the, uh, a log scale. All right, so let's look at the, the blue first. So the blue is associated with what we call mass-specific metabolic rate. So what it, what it is showing is that small birds have relatively high metabolism and that as you get larger and larger, your relative metabolic rate drops. Okay, now let's com compare that to the uh, red dots this is looking at just strict basal metabolic rate. So kind of how much uh, energy does a bird use? And a bigger bird is going to use more energy. So that, that makes sense. And so, um, yes, bigger birds are going to use more energy. Um, now, one of the things I wanted to clarify, so your book, if you notice the units associated with these, both the blue and the, the red, um, they're the same as published, but that's not accurate, right? So uh, the, the mass-specific metabolic rate is the milliliters of oxygen per gram per minute. So that is the one that is mass-specific. It's scaled to the size of the bird. Just looking at the basal metabolic rate, the one on the right, the red dots, um, over here it shows the same units, but really it needs to get rid of that gram. Part, right because again that's that's not what this is showing so I just wanted to clarify that if you were uh, going to study this using the book so size does cause some variation in metabolic rate um, but also where the organism lives is going to contribute to selection pressure uh, adjusting the metabolic rate so if you're living in a tropical area or a, a, a desert area they tend to have lower metabolism for a given size so they're living in, in hotter, warmer habitats. Uh, they don't need as much metabolism. And in fact, if they're too hot, um, the, a, a really high meta metabolic rate could be counterproductive. So I mentioned there could be some benefits associated with having uh, a high metabolic rate and being homeothermic. Well, first of all, being homeothermic means you don't have to have any seasonal or daily limits to your activity. If we look at ectotherms, they are only highly active when they're in the appropriate temperature. But a bird or a mammal doesn't have to worry about that. They can maintain their body, their preferred body temperature, typically, and maintain their, their activity levels uh, throughout the year, throughout the day, independent of what the external temperature is. Now, why, why is that important? Well, certain body temperatures are just better for certain chemical reactions, uh, mechanical um, reactions in the body, for example, muscle contractions, 
uh, neural efficiency. These things are all more efficient at higher temperatures in general. Now there is a limit to that, of course. You can get too hot and we'll talk about some of the problems associated with that. But I mean, just think about it in, from a, a chemistry lab point of view. Um, if you're gonna do a chemical reaction, chemical reactions can occur at room temperature, but a lot of labs say, okay, you know, mix these two chemicals and then um, get, get out your Bunsen burner. Well, the Bunsen burner is a way to increase the speed of those chemical reactions. And so this is the same basic thing, just at a much smaller scale, obviously. So what are some of the costs associated with having a high metabolic rate and high body temperature? Well, one is you can't go a long time without food. You need to have a pretty high amount of food and a relatively constant access to food and water. So one of the things we'll see when we look at foraging behavior, birds have to eat a lot and they have to eat regularly. The other situation here is shown in this figure. Um, once you get too high a body temperature, you leave the realm of chemical efficiency and you start to have some problems chemically. For example, you start to have uh, proteins denature. Uh, proteins don't generally do well at high temperatures. We actually have uh, some proteins that help to prevent some of that called heat shock proteins. Um, but in general, just if you get to a certain extent, you're going to start denaturing proteins. If you look at the number of species in both mammals and birds that uh, generally have that base basal metabolic temperature, we see that birds again are running hotter than mammals and that birds are really pushing the, the limit. Um, you see that there is, the, what the right axis is showing you is that the proteins that have to be replaced daily due to denaturing greatly increases once you get to about 45 degrees uh, Celsius. And birds are right on the edge of that. And so they're, they're kind of pushing the limit of metabolic and, and body temperature, metabolic activity and body temperature to, to be metabolically um, active, but not get into the realm of denaturing those proteins. So with that basic understanding of, of metabolism, we're going to cover in future lectures, starting with digestion in this, this case, but we're going to talk about the interactive systems that are required to keep metabolism going, right? So first of all, you have to have digestion. You have to have food that you break down into the component parts so that you can either have aerobic or anaerobic respiration. And I'm, hopefully you remember that aerobic respiration uh, metabolism is far more efficient in in producing ATPs and that's the goal you're trying to produce ATPs for energy well to have that work you have to have a very efficient circulatory system so the circulatory system is going to not only move the nutrients needed for metabolism to the individual cells that are uh, metabolically active but it's also going to have to deliver oxygen to those tissues to specifically to the mitochondria so that you can have aerobic metabolism well, the higher the aerobic metabolism you have, the higher these chemical reactions are gonna to occur to produce waste products like CO2. So the circulatory system has to take those waste products like CO2 and also the breakdown of uh, nitrogen products and uh, deliver that to the excretory system. So because nitrogen is not good to have in the body in the form of, of ammonia and, and uh, in, in the case of birds, we're gonna see that they produce uric acid to get rid of their nitrogenous waste. But you don't want nitrogenous waste in your body. So again, all of these things have to work together to make a successful metabolic strategy. There have been some interesting studies that have looked at just what are some of the features about a bird in different habitats, in different conditions, like windy conditions versus non-windy conditions, shade versus uh, sunny habitats, and how the basic body shape and color can affect their ability to lose heat or maintain heat. And so here's a model that uh, you can produce that will help to um, actually just record what these temperatures would be in these different environments. Now, what are, what are some of these variables that we found that, that do contribute to maintaining body temperature or shedding uh, heat if you get too hot? Well, one of the things that occurs on an evolutionary scale is body size. There's selection for different body sizes due to different environmental challenges. So for example, a species that has a wide geographic range like the downy woodpecker, the farther south it is, 
the relatively smaller the body size. Compared to northern populations of the same species, they're relatively large. This fits a pattern of what is called Bergman's rule, and this is seen in both birds and mammals, such that as you go north, a species population goes north, they get larger and larger. And the reason for this is as you go north, you face more challenges of retaining your heat. Well, if you're basically a round organism, then, and that's a simplification, but it, it helps to kind of understand what's going on here. If you're basically a spherical organism, as you increase in size, volume-wise, that increases faster than the surface area does. So the volume increases as a cube, roughly, and the surface area increases as a square. So as you get bigger and bigger, you get a larger relative volume and a smaller relative surface area, which means that a bigger bird is going to lose less heat. And that's what you want if you're up north where it's really cold. Going down south, you want the reverse, right? So um, as you get to the situation where you may want to have the ability to shed body heat, you want to have a relatively small volume compared to the surface area. And so that explains this pattern, and it's called Bergman's Rule. Now notice there's also an interesting pattern here. This isn't just a nice straight line going across as you go up north. You see that there are some, some local climatic factors that cause some of these lines make them more like curves. So for example, going up a Miss the Mississippi uh, River Valley, um, that tends to be a little uh, warmer for a given latitude. And the same thing going up a coast. Coastal habitats oftentimes are a little more uh, moderate. And so as you go north, if you stay on the coast, it stays a little bit more moderate and it's not getting quite as cold as, say, the inland area. So again, most birds are going to want to maintain a body temperature around an optimum. So this is what we generally refer to as a thermal neutral zone. And what this is, is it's the temperature range where birds are really maintaining their body temperature without the need for increasing metabolism. So it's, it's what is optimal for their body processes, and it uses a minimum amount of um, metabolism. So it's the most efficient body temperature to, to have. But on either side of that, if you are too cold and you need to warm up, you're going to need to use energy. And that makes sense, right? You're going to need to increase your metabolic rate to kind of warm yourself up. And we'll talk about some other ways that birds can uh, increase their, their uh, warming ability to get back to the therm thermal neutral zone. Now, the right part of this figure may seem a little more bizarre to you at first. So if you need to cool down, in some cases, that actually requires you to use more energy. And that seems counterintuitive, but we're going to come back to that uh, here in a minute and explain what exactly is going on. So when a bird is in its uh, thermal neutral zone, one of the things that kind of helps to keep it there without using metabolic uh, energy is things like down in semi plumes. These are the feathers that we've talked about in lab. These are the feathers that are underneath the contour feathers and they provide the insulating capability of birds. And so if they've worked hard previously to, to generate that metabolic heat, just by having down in semi-plumes uh, a large thick layer of that, um, it allows them to, to keep that in the body so that they're not losing that heat. The contour feathers themselves are important in this as well because they provide that nice smooth uh, exterior barrier to the body and, and, and keep that, so kind of keep a lid on it, and um, cover up the, the down in the semi-plume. And as contrast to that, this figure right here is showing what is called a frizzled chicken. So this is a breed of chickens that uh, has a mutation that causes their contour feathers to stand up and not produce that nice smooth contour. Well, the consequence of this is air can get go through these feathers and get closer to the body and they end up losing heat much more than a regular chicken would. So clearly that wouldn't be adaptive in a natural situation typically, but it just demonstrates the, the physiological concept of, of what those contour feathers can do. Feather color can be important too. So black feathers can help to absorb radiant energy um, and, and allow the, the birds to, to stay in a thermal neutral zone without using any energy. Or in some cases, they can birds like a 
greater roadrunner have uh, black skin and so they can raise their contour feathers and expose their skin to the radiant sunlight and absorb some uh, heat that way. Now these things only work if it's not really windy. A windy environment as we're going to see and using let's say black feathers is actually a way of shedding heat in a windy environment but if it's if it's not windy those same types of colors can be used to absorb heat. And then finally, you know, a relatively low energy way of, of maintaining yourself in the thermal zone is behaviorally. So just get out of the wind. So um, find a, a snow burrow in some cases or a cavity or just behind a tree if a cold wind is blowing. Some birds, even if they're not social, if it gets really cold, they'll huddle together um, as a way to try to maintain their body temperature. There are some physiological ways also of helping to maintain your, your body temperature in the thermal neutral zone. Um, the circulatory system and the legs of birds are adapted in two ways. One is they have the ability to reduce the blood flow to the feet in really cold times. And so that's going to reduce the amount of heat that they could possibly lose as these uh, legs could kind of serve as radiators. So it just restricts that. But you can't completely shut off the blood flow to the feet. I mean, it is a living tissue and it needs to have some blood flow going to it. So they also have a system that there are several routes that blood can go down into the legs of birds. And we'll, we'll talk about um, the, the function of both of these. One way is what is called a countercurrent exchange system. So that's what's shown in this figure here. What you see is the artery as it's running down the leg, clearly it's coming from the core part of the body. It's going to have a, a very hot temperature, so it's going to be kind of the, the whatever the core body temperature is, so relatively warm, going down the legs, being exposed to the cold environment. And what would typically happen if that artery was just isolated, it would lose a lot of heat to the outside environment just through the epidermis. But a countercurrent heat exchange system allows for an alternative transfer of that heat. So in this case, what we're talking about is that artery that's running down the leg is also running right next to the vein that is returning to the core part of the body. And as they're touching each other, the artery is losing temperature as it goes down into the leg, but it's losing that temperature because it's transferring it to the neighboring vein. So the vein, as it's going back up the leg, is its coldest at the feet, but it warms up gradually by taking some of the heat from the neighboring artery. And the artery, as it goes down, is gradually losing some of that because it's transferring it to the vein. So everywhere they're in contact, there's a, a thermal difference such that the artery is just a little bit warmer than the vein. So what are some of the additional things birds can do if they get too cold? Well, it's going to involve increasing their metabolism. And one of the things they can do is just increase their activity. So by increasing your activity, you're going to uh, increase your metabolism and, and generate more uh, body temperature. It could also just involve shivering, particularly the larger muscles of the body. So the flight muscles and the leg muscles are generally the ones that are most responsible for um, shivering and generating some increased uh, metabolism. This turkey vulture here is showing one of the more passive ways you, that you can do it uh, as far as uh, activity. Just finding a sunny perch in, and sunning. So exposing the feathers to the sun and uh, collecting some of that radiant heat. There are times, however, when a bird simply can't maintain homeothermy and so it may selectively go into hypothermia. So this is called facultative hypothermia. And this can help a bird get through some tough times and prevent starvation, maybe overnight or, or some longer time uh, of stress when they might not have access to food. Now this can occur in degrees, so how close they maintain their body temperature to their thermal uh, optimum or how much they let it drop uh, into deeper and deeper hypothermia. So one form is called shallow torpor. So this is where you just, they let their body temperature drop just slightly. They maintain some ability to save some energy and uh, perhaps not starve overnight, but it allows them to keep their, their metabolic activity up just enough so that they're able to respond to some potential threat. Now, deep torpor 
is a situation where they let their body temperature drop so much that sure, they're saving a lot of energy, but they would be very slow to react or wake in response to some kind of threat. And here are some birds that can do this. So hummingbirds and swifts and the night jars are well known for being able to go into different levels of torpor. This is a figure from a previous textbook I used to use, and this is a time period when hummingbirds and swifts were in a different order. Um, but now you notice, if you look at the lab that we covered, the first lab, when we looked at the classification this being used today, lumps these groups in with the caprimulgiforms. And certainly, if you look at those organisms, you think, wow, that kind of seems strange. They don't really look that similar. Um, but genetically, they're very similar, and they certainly share this metabolic capability. Passerines, um, some can go into shallow torpor, but none of them really are capable of going into deep torpor. One of the most extended uses of deep torpor is seen in poor, common poor wills. This is a caprimulga that can be found in West Texas, and this torpor can extend for a long period of time throughout the winter time and allow them to make it through uh, the winter without the need to migrate to an area where they could maintain their activity. So this figure shows you some of the metabolic savings associated with torpor. So on the top, we look at body temperature as it relates to ambient temperature, and the red line is indicating an organism that is maintaining uh, homeothermy. So it is euthermic there. So it's using its metabolic processes to maintain the body temperature across a range of ambient temperatures. Well, what's the cost of this? Well, look at the red line in the figure below, and what it shows is across that range of temperatures, look at how their metabolic rate has to scale up at those really low temperatures. Now let's contrast that to a situation of torpor. During torpor, in cold temperatures, you can save, you can significantly drop your metabolic rate. Now you can't drop it completely, you still have to maintain a certain level of metabolic activity, um, but it's much lower at each temperature compared to when they are uh, maintaining homeothermy at the normal temperature. Now let's go to the opposite extreme. What do birds do when they get too hot? Well, there are various mechanisms they can use to shed heat, and some of these are relatively low energy. So one is kind of a long-term, just adapting to the environment in which you live by reducing the amount of down or semi-plumes that you have. And so if you look at tropical species of birds, they tend to not have a lot of down or semi-plumes underneath their contour feathers. Light-colored plumage um, is also something that can be effective in, in reducing the amount of energy that you absorb and keep you from getting too hot and allow you to, to shed heat. Black feathers actually in windy environments can be used to deflect heat from the body as well. And finally, behaviorally, you can elevate your contour feathers, kind of mimicking what the, those frizzled chickens do um, by elevating the contour feathers, exposing the skin to the wind, allows for evaporative cooling uh, to transfer some of that heat from the body um, into that wind. And also behaviorally, just reducing activity. Remember, increasing activity increases the metabolic rate and increases uh, temperature generation, but reducing activity uh, would have the opposite effect in, in having the potential to lower your temperature. Some animals, actually, some, some birds actually defecate on their legs and this uh, allows them to benefit from a little bit of evaporative cooling. So as that wet uh, feces dries on the legs, moisture evaporate, it also draws the heat away from it. That's what evaporative cooling is. Another way of doing evaporative cooling is by panting. Uh, we'll cover that in a little bit more detail in the next slide, but it's also a form of evaporative cooling. We talked about, again, the uh, counter-current exchange system as a way to reduce heat loss, but when you are too hot, you need to actually use your legs as radiators and use, use that as a, a high surface area structure to release heat and use them as radiators. So you need to bypass the counter-current heat exchange system, and, and birds have, again, separate kind of ways that they can route their blood in, in these cases. And then finally, a, an easy way of evaporative cooling is to bathe. In situations where there's low humidity, what this does is, is as that water is evaporating, it's drawing heat away from the body. And so evaporative cooling works really well in, in dry habitats. Humid habitats, it doesn't work very well. So think about East Texas in the summer when it's really humid, 
Uh, you sweat a lot, but it doesn't do you much good. So I mentioned pat panting as another form of evaporative cooling. So panting involves what is called guler fluttering. So making the basal part of the throat flutter back and forth really fast so that they're drawing in air and letting go of air really quickly across a very moist surface trying to get rid of some of that heat. Now the problem with that is though as it, it requires evaporation so it, it involves lots of water loss. And this is the behavior shown here in this figure that also requires increased metabolism. So that increased guler fluttering, that increased activity, is going to increase metabolism. So it's, it's kind of trying to get rid of heat, but at the same time you have to kind of generate some heat to even make that possible. Generally, when you see a bird with its mouth open, breathing, you'll see guler fluttering, and that is a sign of, of a bird that is very, very heat stressed. When we talk about respiration, we'll see that birds don't generally breathe through their mouth, it's primarily through their nostrils. So we've talked about the benefits of high metabolism, but again, you gotta have a lot of food and you have to have a regular supply of food. So this food is used uh, for both just the general nu nutrients that are used to build and repair tissues like proteins and vitamins and minerals. But from a metabolic standpoint, we're really talking about energy. So energy comes from uh, fats, long-term use of energy. Carbohydrates can be used for more immediate generation of energy. And then also proteins. Proteins are a building block for the body, but proteins can be broken down uh, for an energy source, but usually when these other two, fats and carbohydrates, are not available. So fat is the ability to store energy uh, for an extended period of time. And you see that in th the amount of fat that birds have depends on where they live, and sometimes it varies seasonally depending on the, the needs uh, at different times of the year. So, for example, let's look at the very bottom one here, the yellow-vented bulbul. This is a tropical species. It's living in an area where food resources are relatively constant and, and easy to find, such that they don't need a lot of fat. And as a matter of fact, if you don't need that fat, remember birds try to minimize their weight as much as possible because it makes flight more efficient. So if you look at the uh, fat content in something like a, a tropical species like this bulbul, Wow, it's really low. They're very lean. So, you know, we're looking at, at five grams of lipids uh, for every hundred grams of body weight. Look at the house sparrow up above. This is a temperate zone species, and you see it's kind of a U-shaped pattern, such that in the summer, when it's relatively warm, they have a lower fat content. But November, December, January, February, those are time periods in the winter when food is, is harder to come by perhaps, and through lean times you need a higher fat content, and so they, they do have a much higher fat content. But what is going on with this white crowned sparrow? White crowned sparrows have two, kind of three, but two main peaks associated with high, having high fat content. In addition to kind of the higher wintering fat content that, that we see here, these peaks are associated with migration. Right, so spring migration in uh, April and May is associated with getting some fat together to uh, fuel your long journey. And then the same thing for the fall migration. Fall migration tends to be a little bit more spread out and so you don't see such a, a peak as we see in the uh, spring migration. So what are some of the things that birds eat? Well, fruit eating is seen in quite a few species and this is because it, uh, fruits tend to have lots of carbs and fats and so these are a, a ready source of energy for a lot of birds. Here are two different species of, that produce fruits, and you can see the high concentration of both fats and carbohydrates in the one on the top. Uh, the chokeberry, not as much uh, fats, but look at the carbohydrates, just chock full of sugars. But notice in both these cases, the amount of protein is really low, and this can provide a challenge for frugivorous species. And so some frugivorous species will supplement their diet by eating insects to get proteins. But it turns out that many frugivorous species have simply evolved a more efficient use of the protein that they have. And so they actually require less protein in their diet. And so that's what's shown here in the blue, frugivorous species. Um, their minimum nitrogen requirement is just much lower than uh, omnivorous and, and granivorous birds, which tend to have a higher range of protein needs. 
All right, well, let's get into the digestive anatomy itself. We've already talked about bills and how bills can be modified for different diets, and we'll talk more about that when we talk about foraging itself. But let's, let's assume that they've got the food. Some of the first manipulation of food involves the tongues. And tongues vary in size and shape depending on diet and function. One thing that's true across most birds is they don't have a lot of taste buds. And so the capability of birds to taste their food we think is relatively low. They don't have a very good sense of taste, but we really don't know. It's kind of an understudied uh, field. If you look at the tongue, it varies. So we've already talked about how long the tongues are in woodpeckers, like shown here in C. Much of their tongue feels kind of like sandpaper, and this helps them to capture uh, prey as they're probing with their tongues. But they also have barbs on the tip of it to kind of spear their prey and bring it to the mouth. Some birds uh, have their tongues modified into straw-like features, like this banana quit tongue shown up here in B. But then there are more flat, kind of hand-like, palate-like tongues shown in D and something like a parrot. And then just kind of a general all-purpose tongue shown in A, a sifting tongue like you'd see in a duck in F. And then also some tongues have keratinized horny barbs, um, kind of like the tip of the barbs uh, shown on the woodpecker tongue, but throughout the tongue. And this can be used to handle slimy or slippery prey, particularly in a lot of uh, fish eaters. Another thing that is associated with this early stage of digestion is salivary glands. Salivary glands help to moisten food to help it just move more efficiently into the digestive tract. So it's going to be larger in, in species that eat dry foods like in granivores. And in something like a woodpecker, it's actually a little sticky to, again, just help to subdue the prey and, and deliver it uh, to successfully to the mouth. So here's another example of a fish-eating bird that has these keratinized horny projections, both on the tongue shown down here, but also in the upper palate. Food then moves from the mouth through the esophagus, which is basically just a thin uh, muscular passageway to the digestive tract, but it can also be used as a storage structure in some birds. Additionally, the esophagus can be modified to produce air sacs that can be inflated in some species, and this can, in, it can influence the sound that is produced when they're producing vocalizations uh, by increasing the resonance. Uh, in some cases, it can be used as a visual display in courtship, like in this uh, sage grouse. So I mentioned storage capability in the esophagus of some birds. When that is the case, when it's an important part of the digestive system, it's referred to as a crop. So it's an expanded region so that they can store food that they may have eaten at one time, but it's just not ready to go through the digestive process yet. And so it's kind of like a, a holding area. The crop of some birds, particularly uh, some of the folivores, is quite large. So Hawatsons uh, are, are leaf eaters, and that's just something that plant material is just hard to digest. And so they store this food in their crop, and it's associated with fermentation by symbiotic bacteria. And this is actually where most of the digestion occurs in this species, this folivore oliverous species before it actually moves to the rest of the digestive tract uh, for absorption. Once we get through the esophagus, then we enter the stomachs, and stomachs is true because we're, we generally have two chambered stomachs in birds. The relative size of each of these varies depending on the diet. So the first stomach you come to is called the proventriculus, and this is generally associated with chemical digestion. The proventriculus leads to the ventriculus, also referred to as the gizzard. This is generally a highly musculature part of the digestive tract and is involved with mastication. So the, the strong muscle contractions help to chew up the food because birds don't really chew their food with their beaks. So they tend to swallow it whole or in big chunks and then have chemical digestion occur in the proventriculus and mastication occur in the gizzard. Well, so some of the things that help the gizzard be more efficient at chewing up that food is the lining of the, the gizzard oftentimes has these keratinized projections that uh, help to chew the food up, but then they'll also 
swallow rocks. And these rocks or grit also provides a hard structure that can help grind up the food in the gizzard. Not everything can be digested though, and so some of the undigested particles like some of the bones in many of the carnivores are ejected as pellets. Many of you have heard of owl pellets, and owl pellets are basically just the parts that have come up from the gizzard that are not digestible, so it's seen in lots of carnivores like owls, but it can also be seen in some insectivorous birds. So sometimes you'll see flycatchers doing this, um, it was a very common thing when we were studying bee eaters. Bee eaters produce these uh, small pellets of undigestible parts of the, the insects that are eaten, the exoskeletons. Past the stomach, the uh, food goes into the small intestines. The size of this varies. It's going to be much longer in many of the herbivorous species, again, because it's just so hard to digest plant material, and so it, it, they need more surface area to get as much out of that as they can. The bile ducts drain into the small intestine and this helps to increase the efficiency of fat digestion and absorption. The pancreas is also found in the folds, the beginning folds of the small intestine and this produces insulin and other enzymes again to help in the, the breakdown of, of food and absorption of, of those products. At the base of the small intestines are two branched diverticula which are called cecae, and these cecae vary in size but what they do is they house bacteria so they're going to be more prominent in many herbivorous species because they're associated with fermentation at this stage of the digestive tract. Now this is not nearly as efficient as the fermentation that we would see in something like the Watsons. Remember the Watsons had their fermentation occur in the crop such that most of that was broken down by the time it got to the small intestines. Here we're talking about trying to get some some digestion occurring through fermentation after most of the uh, absorptive surface has already been passed. And so um, food is, is processed uh, relatively quickly but inefficiently in species that uh, show this kind of fermentation. Some of the features uh, that are increase the absorption in the small intestines are the villi. So the little finger-like projections that increase the surface area to increase the efficiency of absorption of the small intestines is similar to what we see in mammals. Then the uh, material moves into the large intestines. The large intestines are relatively small. Their primary focus is in water resorption and concentration of the waste. And finally, the waste products are dumped into the cloaca, and the cloaca is a common chamber that receives digestive waste, nitrogenous waste, and also when we talk about reproduction, um, the gametes. And that is the end of the digestive tract and also the end of this lecture.